Um, could you be administered by pot staff? Good morning, everybody. Are we good? All right. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you had a lovely evening last night and um, that you've been having a wonderful time here in New York City. Um, we uh, whipped up a really beautiful day for you today. Um, and uh, uh, today's a half day, so hopefully you'll get to enjoy it um, this afternoon um, on your way home or wherever it is that you're headed uh, uh, after the summit. Um, a couple of uh, announcements, I guess, or, or uh, just comments. I want to thank Nancy Motondo, who's sitting out there at the registration desk. <laughs> Nancy, we're talking about you. Um, and everybody uh, who helped to put this together, um, including the Coat staff and the Provost's office and the Global Center and Kim Scalzo, who I just uh, see there in the doorway, um, for uh, you know supporting and making um, uh, everything possible. And I want to thank all of you um, for attending. And any of those, um, um, Lisa and Christine Kroll, Lisa Dubuck and Christine Kroll and Greg Ketchum, and all of you who are uh, tuning in virtually. Um, we miss you, um, but we're really glad that you can uh, follow along virtually. Um, and uh, I want to um, just um, uh, thank you guys for being here and uh, for participating and engaging all of the faculty and the people who are not he here usually, who, who for whom this is your first time. I really appreciate you attending and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation beyond the end of the summit in our online communities uh, that we have available for continued um, you know interaction and um, and hope that you will. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, participate in some of the uh, coat activities that we have um, and that we offer. Um, so uh, today I, is um, um, the Newton Board, the National University Technology Network uh, Board is here, has been here with us all week uh, and is here with us today. This is the Newton Engagement Day. And so if you're in Newton, would you please uh, raise your hand, one of the Newton Board members? Great. Great. So um, we have um, featured today um, uh, some speakers from the Newton Board, uh, and we also have planned um, for our final presentation an interactive activity of networking um, uh, between us and the folks from uh, the Newton Board. And so I'm very, very pleased uh, to be able to uh, to bring Newton uh, to this event to um, demonstrate the N, the networking in Newton um, with you in this real live way. And um, and to uh, to help to illustrate um, the benefits of membership in the National University Technology Network. Um, so if you have any questions about Newton, if you have any um, um, interest in um, learning more about Newton, please seek out one of the board members and um, exchange cards and and um, and talk to them. Um, so uh, I have cards. did I cover everything? Did I miss anything? Um, Okay, I, th I think not. I think we will uh, get us started with the first speaker uh, this morning, and I'll set him up for you. And um, uh, Kevin Bell is um, a, a, the executive director of uh, for online curriculum development and deployment at the College of Professional Studies at Northeastern University. And I'm not going to read his bio to you, but um, I can tell you that um, being on the board and having had the opportunity to interact and talk with him, and then also at other um, events, um, I ha am very, very excited to have him um, uh, talk with us about how uh, gameful design, not gamification, is going to save education. So Kevin, thank you very much for coming. Um, warm welcome for Kevin Bell. OK. So I'm going to play with technology for a little piece. I've got a, a bit of a cold. Sorry about that. Um, this should now be on. Yes. That's good. So now I can st I've worked out I can stand in the middle, and you can still hear me, but then I can't see any of the screen, so you'll have to tell me what's up. So I'll try not to, to wander too much. Um, 
So this is it, really. You need aluminium hats and goggles, and you do that with all your students, and that's pretty much uh, where we're at with that. But, uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, I'm excited about this. I'm actually currently teaching a workshop, so I ran slides by some of my participants last week, and, and they, didn't, um, they didn't all run from the room screaming or anything like that. Um, it's, I, I trimmed the PowerPoint. There's actually a couple of people who, who are unfortunate enough, I think Alex is one of them, to have seen this presentation at OLC. So I thought, I'll have to change something, otherwise she'll um, completely fall asleep, as will I think the other guy who said he'd seen it. Um, so I'll skim through what, what I like about this. I mean, there's a bit of theory, there's a bit of... Um, I'm British, so I use, use words like waffle. There's a bit of waffle in there. Um, but probably the, the funnest part is that there are case studies that I met during the course of my dissertation. Um, I finished my doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago now. Um, and I've kept in touch with these guys. And what was fun was I started looking at just how to intrinsically motivate students in online courses. Um, so I thought the presentation was great yesterday. She hit so many of the areas that we were sort of seeing around instructor engagement and you know I could I could sort of circumvent all of this by saying it doesn't matter how good the course is as we heard yesterday if the instructor doesn't show up whether it's online or face to face it's not a good experience so I do tie a lot of this back to faculty and it's not just so that they don't hate me and throw me from the room I think it's a really valid um, point of what we're trying to do um, but the interesting thing when I worked with the faculty who were um, featured in the, in the case studies was they approached things really differently. They all had a label of gamification. I actually don't mind Christy and Alex uh, giving me a hard time as if I'm going to pedantically throw them from the room. I don't mind the term gamification. It, it's a good umbrella term and it does cover a lot of ways that people are trying to intrinsically motivate students. Um, and you'll see when I get to the four cases that the faculty approached this in very different ways. They did things very differently from each other but they all kind of had positive effects. They didn't have huge sample sizes. It wasn't a longitudinal study, so I'm not going to retire on the back of it. But there was enough there to say this is interesting. We should keep looking at it. Um, so I think gamification is fine as a, as a broad sort of umbrella. But as you'll see in a second when I, when I dig in, there are different sort of ways that people are categorizing this. And the main reason that I sort of avoid gamification now is um, it's become a bit like the, the M word, the MOOC word in terms of being something that immediately half the room want to run and scream and hide and the other half are super, super excited and they ask when the World of Warcraft version is coming out. Um, and I use that as a sort of term meaning what you'll see in this presentation are, are hopefully not examples that, may, that immediately make you switch off and say, well, this isn't for me. I don't have that budget. Um, all of the, the cases that I show um, were either bootstrapped by the faculty member himself, sorry, they are all males, um, or they had sort of minimal tech support of the kind that I think most of us would have access to. If we've got an LMS person who's pretty smart and can tweak a few things or um, can write a few little code uh, uh, elements, then we could all kind of do what these people have done. And what I've said to the class that I'm teaching this week is let's napkin sketch everything out. If you want to do a leaderboard, hell, do it in Excel or do it in Word and throw it around. And then when you get the good feedback and students say, OK, I like this, I didn't like that, then the bits they like that seem to work are the ones that you could invest in. So I'm kind of against the, the $50,000 upfront simulation that you buy from a vendor and then it's stuck and the students all roll their eyes at it. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the slide deck, there's that element of educational games where they aren't very educational and they're not much fun. I think that's where we were sort of 10 years ago. And hopefully, um, you know, we're, we're getting beyond that and starting to dig in a little bit more to the reasons why things might work and might motivate students. My, my chair at Penn almost killed me and said, if you're doing intrinsic motivation, particularly for underrepresented minorities in online education, we're going to be here for six years and she wouldn't let me stay for six years. So I narrowed down and I found the cases that were of most interest to me were people who were coming at this G thing, the gamification thing. Um, but it was more the sort of mindset of, of what that meant. It meant they, they were kind of trying stuff and they were having a bit of fun and trying to engage students. And this is key. They weren't afraid of failing. They weren't afraid to try stuff. Um, and, and they 
one of my theories is that they're all sort of this, unfortunately the same gender, sorry, apologize. Um, they're also about the same age. And one of the slides sort of mentions, just as a note, Space Invaders came out in 1978. So is that something that you think, oh yeah, my dad told me about that, or is that something you think, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, if you're the latter, then you're probably like me, you're hitting that stage in your career where you may be able to take a chance or two without being <clears throat> busted. For it. And, and what I found with my practitioners, I looked around at one point and thought, oh, God, they're all white, middle-aged white men. And I'm like, look in the mirror. Um, <laughs> so, so I did that and, and thought, There's a, why is that? And the reason was, you know, they, they'd been exposed to stuff like Space Invaders and the, the first, you know, it was beyond Pong. It was, pre, pre, it was Pong and Breakout. And then they hit Space Invaders and people said, wow, this, this is actually sort of cool stuff. Then 20 years went by, or 30 years, or whatever, and they had their first faculty position or their first administrative position. And you know, for the first 10 years, you're probably terrified of doing anything that's slightly off track in case you get busted. And then they hit sort of the place that you know, some of us are at now, where you know you've got a bit of, a bit of credibility, not much, um, and you can maybe try something. And certainly, my my cases, you know, they were at that sort of. Um, uh, associate professor, professor chair, you know, they were at a place where they felt, I can try stuff and I'm not worried about someone coming in my classroom and saying, what are you doing, why are you doing this, I've got enough credibility that I can try some stuff, damn it, and if it works, great, and if it doesn't, then I'll try something else. So the, it, I use the G thing almost now as the mindset of, you know, let's just throw that out there and see the, the reactions on the faces, and we'll dig in a little bit as we go through. Um, okay, it's 9.15, I can start now. Sorry, right? <laughs> it's OCD or something. Um, so this is building a little bit on Daniel's presentation yesterday, which I think uh, most of us sat through. So I'm going to give you some assumptions. You can see the last one. I've already, uh, I've already uh, thrown that one out there. Um, but my theory, looking at this, I, I, you know, did a normal, proper education in England. You may have noticed a bit of an accent. And then I came over to the states for a year. Um, because my wife had discovered a master's degree she fancied doing in a place called Vermont. Um, and I came over, she was pregnant, I wasn't. Um, <coughs> we'd met in Japan. I go to Japan and I'm the only gaijin that comes back with a French Canadian. That's guaranteed. Um, so we came back and, and Vermont was the, comp it was the Switzerland, it was the compromise solution. It wasn't England but it wasn't Canada. Um, and she was going to do her master's in intercultural management which was cool, uh, a small college called SIT, the School for International Training. I was going to sit on top of a hill, study kanji, and be an earth father. Um, didn't really work. I, I stumbled into a, a place called the Marlborough College Graduate Center, which was in downtown Brattleboro next to the museum. And uh, this kind of slightly quirky um, college president at the main campus uh, Maine with no E on the end. Uh, Marlborough College, which was a small, is a small liberal arts uh, college in the middle of nowhere, had decided that this internet thing was kind of cool, and he decided to set up in a, in a very kind of, for Vermont, techie building, downtown Brattleboro, where he launched hybrid programs. They were about a year long, master's degrees. The minimum credit you could get to get one was, uh, you know, 30 credit, fast-paced, hybrid courses, met once every two weeks, and then was online. Um, and I sort of stumbled into that. I'd been, I'd been teaching English in Japan. And I'd been trying stuff out. Where I, my parents are all teachers. My brother's a teacher. But I'd never had any teaching theory. So I did what I'm doing now, sort of you know, spoke to a crowd of 50 vaguely engaged uh, people, <laughs> maybe. Um, and I had no, no idea what I was doing. But, but you know, I'd sort of learned, oh, if I try this and do this and prep a little bit and that sort of thing. So I, I kind of stumbled into an MAT and thought, oh yeah, this is sort of the reason why that bit works and that bit doesn't work. So I got this MAT teaching with technology. The grad school was Marlborough College Graduate Center and the college president was Paul LeBlanc, <laughs> uh, who couldn't make it down yesterday. So I, can, I met him, I met him once when he came off the tennis court and walked into our classroom, and another time at graduation where he shook my hand and I thought that was kind of it. And then I went off and got like a dot-com thing in Boston um, and, and got asked to teach, to adjunct for Marlborough. They were partnering with Cambridge College, and I got a chance to sort of keep my, my uh, foot in the game, if you like, um, teaching. And loosely sort of kept in touch with the environment there. Um, fast forward a little bit more. 
um, went back and became the director of the Graduate Center at Marlborough. Um, and Paul had just gone to southern New Hampshire, so we missed each other by about three months. I thought, huh. But I inherited my predecessor's inbox, and she had lots of emails back and forth with Paul. Um, and I saw a lot of things that he would try, and then he'd say, oh, you know, I know I had that great idea, but I decided to pull it back. When there was a faculty member called Mark Francel, and he used to play basketball with a lot. And he said, oh, when I saw Mark missing every three-point shot he tried, I realized I was putting too much stress on the faculty. So I thought, this guy seems funny, he seems interesting, kept loosely in touch. And um, ultimately, I, I went and worked at Southern New Hampshire. I was kind of Michelle before Michelle was Michelle. Um, it was, it, it, she's the evolution of, of kind of what I did there. I was there those years from 2008 to 2012 um, when I oversaw the online and continuing ed. And then she mentioned the sort of startup group that, that kicked off the Innovation Lab in College for America. I was the academic lead of that. So, so it was a great experience, a great time. Um, and that's sort of how I've had this connection with online slash hybrid. And wedding that to some of the studies we did at Penn around policy and access, these were sort of the conclusions that I came up with that, again, is driving quite a bit of this. Um, you know, we want to educate a lot more people. So I'm, I'm putting these up as assumptions almost for anyone to say, oh, hang on, I disagree with that. So, you know, we want to educate a lot more people. These people are often coming from different back, differing backgrounds than our traditional students. Um, the, the, we can't build dorms and things like that fast enough. Um, certainly not lazy rivers and things like that. Um, so online's got to have a role somehow. Um, I'm concerned about, and you heard that question that came up yesterday that was the, the correct one to ask of Michelle. You have models, models like College for America that we all thought, this is a good idea, this is worth a try, but it's trying to engage the toughest audience to engage, probably. You know, if it were College for America for... You know, Mitt Romney's kids, the, the rich white kids, it would probably be fine. It would work well because they'd be socializing and then they'd come and do some study. The target demo that we were going for there, you know, single parents working three jobs, 5,000 reasons not to do this and maybe one to do it, which is I want to make my life a little bit better. So, you know, we, if we can accept the conclusion that online's got a role to play, then the other part of my thesis would be we've got to try stuff to engage and motivate this audience because they have so many reasons not to persist. And, and you know, we've got to try and ramp that up and, and give them some uh, encouragement when they're in there. OK, so I, I touched on this. The whole gamification piece, um, the title, uh, anyone, Monty Python? Um, so you'll hear all these terms. And I, and I wouldn't worry too much about them, to be honest. The whole gamification, gameful design. There's a great presentation. <laughs> Um, that I, I wrote about recently by a guy, guy called Robert Trippenbach out of England where he says uh, game dynamics is the term. But there's not a quiz and you're not going to get dinged if you use the wrong one. Um, the key bit that I, I, I spoke at WCET and someone tweeted this and I thought that I don't think I said it that well so I copied the tweet. Um, you know, and it's, it's this part. It's, it's about the teaching. And what I think is that the technology and now the sort of thought around pedagogy is moving forward to the extent that we can accentuate the things that good teachers do. And, and that really is the key element with all of this. I don't think we want to say, you know, we can put a game in place or a robot or whatever in place and you now do not have to teach. The teacher's not replaced by any of this. Um, so having said that the language, don't worry about it, I'm, I am settling on gameful design, uh, so deal with that. Um, and and it, it grew, at, at least in part, at, at Northeastern we got, um, I got, I got encouraged to do a SNU at, at Northeastern, which, I don't know, it's, it's the, the whole Greek and French thing comes to mind. It, it's like speaking a different language. So it's, it's definitely a different experience to try and do a SNU at Northeastern. Um, you know, things like tenure and governance and uh, a, a provost who isn't as accommodating as a provost at Southern New Hampshire. Um, all add to the mix, and all, this is being recorded, isn't it? I should have thought of that. Um, <laughs> God. I've got my performance review on March 1st. This is going to go down well. <laughs> um, so we, we built a model at Northeastern that was, you know, re, in many ways we were trying to reassure and say, look, we know what we're doing, and this, is, this has valid validity, sorry, and it's rigorous. So there's a guy called Dick Clark, not the dead pop idol one, the USC Rossler School of Education. Um, main lead. You, you may have heard of him or Braw Saxberg and others um, who, who've done a lot of work on the cognitive science of this. So some of the bits when I started looking at gameful design, it was familiar because of the work we'd done in cognitive science. So any of 
the room who've looked at learning design in those kind of areas. When you start to talk about things like chunking content and giving immediate feedback and, and not cognitively overloading, there's a lot of that that, that seemed to me to be the Venn diagram overlap with what I'm calling gameful design. Um, specifically, gameful design is, is looking at what makes games fun or engaging, and it doesn't have to be games. It can be sports or it can be a book or a movie or a play like the one I went to see last night. And, and thinking, you know, why am, I, why am I engaged in this? Why is it holding my attention? And uh, I, I, I mentioned that I, I always think when I give this presentation, I should somehow put a game in it because that's what I'm talking about. Um, and, and one of my colleagues said, if you do that, I'm just walking out of the room. So I won't be doing that. But it's the elements that make something engaging. And can you boil them down? And can you then apply some of them to teaching? Um, so, so why go that way? Why not the full-on games? Um, this is a new slide for anyone who's seen it, the presentation before, so enjoy this one. Um, so this, this theory that, you know, oh, my students, this room, you have to have your back to someone. Um, this theory that your students are all playing games on their phone all the time, it's actually not true. Um, I am Gen X, so millennials are actually doing less of that than we are. So we who are starting to get old and middle-aged, you know, we think our students are completely focused on games and things like that. They're not. They're focused on gamefully designed apps. So, and, and we all are a little bit. You know, if you think Facebook and anything you're doing, they've added some new emoticons or whatever this week, you're actually engaging more typically with, with apps that are using the principles of gameful design than you are playing games, which isn't to say that anyone who's playing games right now is, is bad. That's fine if you're doing that. They do still do them, but millennials uh, do this, what do they call it, over, they over-index. They, they actually um, do more of the sort of gameful, appy sport. You know, so so the, they'll, they'll be on apps for everything. They'll be you know, checking in. They'll be whatever they're doing, you know, Facebooking, slash Foursquaring, slash whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, but they're not typically gaming as much as even we were. So the space invader generation who's like, oh, yeah, the kids are totally into this. Uh, you probably don't want to try and do a retro version of Space Invaders to engage them. You want to dig into gameful design and say, why are they um, focused on this? And can I put any of that in my instruction? So to give you a, uh, some sort of initial um, tenets, if you like, to take away, um, <laughs> the lady who presented on badges yesterday, is she still here? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm not going to diss badges, but... <laughs> the, 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 one of the, I think the key element to, to sort of consider is, is the difference between these two. I like that I can zoom between them. So, you know, you take your kid shop and he hates it, you give him a lollipop, he's fine for two minutes and then he's screaming again, I'm assuming it's a he, versus you're doing something that is just exciting by virtue of doing it. I think that's the challenge. I, I don't mind badges at all. I just question exactly what we're achieving with them. I, I'll quite happily do the what I call serendipitous awards. So the class I'm teaching now, I'm happy to reach out and say, that was the best post of the week. You know, thanks for logging in seven days out of seven or whatever. So I mean, the, the sort of positive pats on the head, if that's what badges are, I think that's fine. Um, I also think that other side where it's interesting to wonder whether alternative credentials will work. It's the bit in the middle that I'm not sure of where the badge from Northeastern University saying you're a leader, is that a pat on the head, or is that saying you don't need the leadership degree? And, and I, I, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to focus too much on badges, but the work I've seen has suggested that employers um, aren't going to bother to click through a badge to see your work, to see that you can do leadership. I, I think in certain areas, the Googles, et cetera, where it's coding skill, it's obviously valid. But um, I think what we're trying to do with the work that I'm leading out in Northeastern in particular is say, how can we make the experience actually fun not have the experience be deadly, but you get a badge at the end. So again, I think there's a, there's a role, and, and um, if, uh, if the presenter was still here, I would, I would still say this. I think it's, it's a good discussion to have. So wh what you're really trying to get to, I think, is this place where, wow, you know, the, the play I saw last night, Huey, recommended, by the way, Forrest Whitaker. Um, he was in it. He wasn't with me. Um, <laughs> If you go and do something or see something or you're, you're engaged in something and you think, wow, it's already 11 o'clock, that was fun, then that's this condition that, that this guy in particular wrote a lot about flow. Um, anyone want to have a stab at the pronunciation of his name? 
No? Um, chick sent me high is, is the best that I've got at it. Um, so he, he talks about this, and Jane McGonigal's kind of, you know, she's cuter, she's younger than him, so she gets more publicity. But um, she's sort of taken this, and if, if you've read her recent work, Super Better, or the one before, Real, is it, what's her book called, the first one? Reality's program, that's right. Um, and she presented at South by Southwest next week, if anyone really wants to go. She's, just, she's running with this, and, and that's not to diss her. She's based uh, you know, her work on lots of different theorists. But it's the concept that something that's either painful or miserable or mundane can be made interesting if you start to throw things like rules in there. So you know, I'm going to mow the lawn, but can I do it faster than I've ever, ever done it before without going over the edges and killing the flowers? There are rules, and there are sort of restrictions that you've put in place. So I think that's what I want to explore when we're looking at education. Look at things that make, so I mentioned a couple there, rules and, and uh, sort of restrictions and challenge. Three elements there. As, as we go through and I show some examples, maybe keep, keep some mental notes as to other elements that you think that's clearly a, an important part of a game or an activity that is going to maybe engender flow, which means I'm going to engage with it for longer. And that is the best proxy we've got in most cases. I know data analytics is going to change the world. I'm not sure that I can say that to my faculty with a straight face. But um, you know, as we dig in, we may see other behavioral elements that we say, that's the key thing. Do more of that, and you definitely learn. For now, we've got, honestly, logins and engagement. And you know, engagement and time on task correlates to outcomes. My chair was the stats instructor at, at Penn, so she would shudder when I use words like correlate because she would really sort of focus in and does it correlate or does it just, uh, you know, is it, is it causation or correlation, all that sort of stuff. But that's kind of what we've got at the minute. So to my mind, the more engagement you can get, the better shot you've got at good outcomes. Um, and to sort of take this and, and put it through an example, I'm not really a golfer, but my brother is, some of my family are. Uh, half of them are Scottish, so that explains that. Um, but they would say, you know, I go out and play golf, and wow, five hours went by, and it, I got soaking wet and miserable, but you know what? It was great fun, really. Um, so, so I gave you a couple there for the mowing the lawn. Um, just to give you a, a few visual examples, playing golf, you've got clear goals. There are clear rules. You have to play from the tees, the men's tees, ladies' tees, all that sort of stuff. You have to wear shorts. That's not one of the rules. Um, you get pretty immediate feedback. The ball goes in the hole or it doesn't, or in my case, the water or, or not. Um, and you know, there's, there's definitely a level of challenge. For me, it's staying in sort of single digits when I play a hole, uh, maybe breaking 100 if I play nine holes, um, 18. Um, and there's a sense of achievement. It's, it's not easy. And you know, when you do it, you feel great about it. So. Um, so I'm going to skip into the, the case studies. These are the four that, that made the cut. Um, I had a couple of others. I, I talked to SNU in their College for America process, and the, um, the lead of that project is, is looking at gamification to, to sort of see if they can increase the engagement, but they weren't quite there yet. So University of, of New Hampshire was my first one. Um, great guy. Do I need my coffee? So, thank you. Um, Great guy called Neil Nyman. He's, he's written a book that, that came out fairly recently that, that's uh, maybe worth looking up. And, and you're going to get this slide deck, so um, you could always Google him and find him. Um, microeconomics instructor, arguably not the funnest subject in the history of the world. Um, and also, he's, he's uh, the sort of entry level microeconomics. So he has a lot of students who have to do it almost as a gen ed requirement, who really don't like it, who feel math challenged, who feel I can't do this. So he's got that classic audience of you know, what I would say is weak mindset or poor mindset. They think they're bad at it. They are pretty confident they're going to hate it, and they just need to get it done, but time is going to drag. Um, he, um, he's not a fan of, of the extrinsic pieces, so he was very much anti-leaderboard, anti-badges, uh, that kind of thing. He, um, he's all about stories, and he... You know, is a Facebooker. His wife does something. I can't. It's like needlework or crocheting or something like. I don't know. She's in a in a clubby sort of thing with lots of social interaction and feedback. Um, but his belief is that stories are, are. You know, that's how we exist. That's how we've educated for years and years and years. Um, and his his first venture was was funny. He's you know he's he's probably. I'm going to say he's a few years older than me, but I think everyone is because I still think I'm 27. Um, but he's you know he's a heavier but guy, slightly balding. And to demonstrate a principle that I won't even venture at guessing, he got on the tennis court with his TA to show you know, sort of parabolas, loops, 
somehow connected to microeconomics. And he stopped at some point. He's like, you know, here I am, like 47, fat, balding, white guy, trying to play tennis to show. And, and he just, he realized it wasn't strong. And, and he'd played with the idea of putting stories in. And you'll see one of the cases later, there is a narrative. It's a quest. It's, a, you know, an adventure that I or he, the faculty members, sort of envisaged. Neil's idea, I think, was brilliant. What he said was, why should I dictate the story? He said, I have sweaters older than some of my students. So, you know, his frame of reference of saying, hey, let's do a Star Trek adventure or let's, you know, I, mine would be sort of a Doctor Who from the original Doctor Who. Um, and even his TA, who was 27, said, um, you know, I'm 27 and my, my examples are dated. You know, if, if you're hitting the vampires when people have moved on to the zombies, you're just so, so square. Um, so he split his class, and it was really interesting. He had a, a team of students developing it. He, uh, his, he's UNH, so they're Blackboard-based. But they kind of you know, got out into kind of bloggy world, very low tech. But he would teach. The class was split. He would teach some core principles. You have to learn this. You have to learn this. You, you know, so diminishing returns and you know, these microeconomics um, concepts. And then he, the students would create their own story. And that was a fundamental part of the class, that everyone had to create a narrative that used these terms. So, you know, he got, there was a Matt Damon movie about leaving Earth to search for water around that time. So scarcity was a key part of that. And one of the students wrote a sort of Matt Damon movie script that featured these microeconomics terms. The other student that he, he, he shared time with um, talked about her grandfather coming from Russia and becoming a citizen and he and his family had left Russia because of the scarcity there, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got Matt Damon and sci-fi, and then you've got my actual grandfather from Russia. Do you care how the students remember all of the terminology? Because they both did. And he ended up, you know, in his class, 20 students or whatever it was, it was a key part. They had to share their stories. So, you know, you may think, how would you do that? Yeah, I'd maybe do a Doctor Who. But, you know, I kind of guarantee if you think about this afterwards, you'll probably think, you know, that Russian grandfather coming to the US. I mean, that, if that's your family story, you're going to remember that. So the mnemonic tools that they used were personalized to them. So personalizing may be an aspect. Um, and illustrated the concepts and made them sort of valid for, for them, the students. He had rules in the class. You know, you had a time limit to develop this. You had to share your story. You had to read other people's stories. Um, they did have a sort of, uh, he didn't have a leaderboard, but you know, they did sort of vote up and down or like uh, the different stories. So there was an element of, of collaboration and competition. Um, and he, he had good results. He, um, he had a better completion rate than he'd seen in his class um, the, the 20 times he taught it previously. Um, and he had a significant number of students who decided they were going to focus in on economics and continue with that. He had, more, he had students who were gen ed kind of approaching who were undeclared, who declared that they were interested in, in exploring microeconomics and economics further um, in, their, in their major at UNH. So, um, so sort of storyline to illustrate key points. I thought that was an interesting one. Um, I went up to Gamification 2013. 2013 um, was a conference up in Waterloo, which is Ontario, Canada. Um, and I went up because I was needing another case study and didn't really find one in the presenters and was about to think, ugh, this damn country. My wife's Canadian. Um, <laughs> and sat down next to this guy, Greg Andrus, who's uh, uh, a great guy. Um, also, again, sorry, balding, white, middle-aged. Um, but an, a, a triathlete, so he's, he's healthy at least. Um, <laughs> and what was interesting with Waterloo was... Um, they, they actually, no one, no one had told me, Northeastern, you know, we're a bit siloed, so I'm like, oh, I'm going up here, blah, blah, great. Turns out, subsequently, that you, Northeastern had really been sort of formally in contact with Waterloo, um, because Waterloo have a co-op program, and they seem to do it really well. Northeastern has a co-op that we've had for centuries that is sort of an appendage. We're trying to, to make more use of it and, and make it more valid. Um, but Waterloo, the students go out on a co-op. While they're out, they do some online courses. They really struggle to engage the students in those online courses because the students are out in the real world. And that lack of sort of overlap between real world focus, get the job done, and oh, academic crap stuff I have to do online, they were seeing a real disconnect. So Greg took uh, this course, which was uh, business ethics, and gamified parts of it. Now, his was Moodle-based, I'm pretty sure, Moodle or Canvas. 
Um, I'm going to go with Canvas, actually. His was Canvas-based. And he had a tech support guy. So he, did have, he was the only one who had any tech support for any of this. I mean, Neil, who I just mentioned, had sort of TAs and grad assistants who played with blogs, but basically no tech assistant, no budget. Um, this guy, he reckoned his tech guy put in what they added up to about $10,000 worth of coding time and effort. So, you know, there's a price to this one. Um, but what they built out were little, little scenarios where they were presented with an ethical dilemma that was connected to a work environment, and the students had to respond to the dilemma with what they would do. It was scored, but it was really, you know, the, the answers weren't, you're right, you're wrong. It was kind of, well, that's interesting that you think that. Let's talk about it. So he was really trying to broke a discussion. He had leaderboards, um, which you can see there. He, um, those of you who are going to ask the FERPA question, uh, advisable to anonymize the leaderboard except for your score. So you can see that you're third in the league, but you can't see that Mel's above you or below you and that sort of thing. So you saw where you were on the leaderboard. He got that boy thing where the boys rushed ahead and did all the games so they could be top of the leaderboard. Um, so the leaderboard maybe didn't help him that much. He felt the discussions were a little richer. I'll give you an example of one. I'm not sure if it's the one that's on the screen. Um, he gave the ethical dilemma where... Um, you're going for a job interview and the potential employer says, I want to look at your Facebook profile because I want to know what sort of person you are. Do you give the employer access to your Facebook profile? In the scenario that he'd drawn out, um, let's say I was going for the job interview, but I knew that Ian was also going for the job interview and we're kind of friends. I'm not that keen on him. Um, <laughs> I, I have a clean Facebook profile and I'd be fine with an employer seeing it. I know that he parties, sorry, and, and drinks heavily and, and does, yeah, it's pictures of topless. Um, so I know Ian, and I know what this employer is asking. is a bit dubious, really. I shouldn't have to give him my Facebook, but I know if I give him my access and say, yeah, yeah, definitely, he's kind of knackered. Because he either says to the employer, you can't see mine, which is good, because I look like the you know, cooperative one. Or he says, okay, you can, and then they're going to see him you know, in New Orleans and all these other places that he's been. Um, so that was the ethical dilemma. That's an example. So you can see, I mean, the Canvas kind of pop up y thing was just a, a presentation of a scenario. Um, they clicked through it. They got to sort of, you know, pick an option and then they had to discuss it and write about it. And their performance sort of pushed them up a leaderboard or not. So it was kind of, it was very simplistic. It was the most techy in terms of build, but not something that you couldn't replicate with discussion boards and quizzes and, you know, a, a, and even a rudimentary leaderboard. I, I sent my class last night how to make a leaderboard on Google Docs, which I Googled and, and found. So, um, so, you know, there's definitely ways that you can do this at, at zero to low cost, I would say. Um, Greg got good engagement. He got good feedback from the students. No sort of quantitative data from him particularly. Um, but what, what I found with this when I've been talking about this before in the, on, or in the workshop that I was doing, we, we talk about, like, let's reduce fear of failure. And yet, you're all frightened to try this. What, what these guys all got, even the very, very low tech, I interviewed a lot of students who took these courses. The students were hugely appreciative of anything these faculty did, just to sort of try stuff out. They got next to no negative feedback about the technology or it being clunky. They were just so appreciative that someone tried something. And in every case, some elements clearly worked. So the feedback was, oh, it was great that he tried it. We really appreciated it. And you know, this bit seemed better. So I mentioned you know, being 40-something and maybe not being on the first rung of the career ladder encourages you to take risks. But what I've seen from this is that anything that you try will be generally well-received. And if it's very low-tech and you get great feedback, great. Then go and you know, talk someone into spending some money. So I think you know, the, the trying is as, is as um, appreciated as the, the actual outcomes in many places. Um, I'm just going to have a sip. So this was a MOOC, which was fun because I hadn't anticipated doing any. Um, Kevin Yee's an instructor, a very interesting guy, PhD in German and worked at Disney, which seems like a sort of, I don't know, slightly uh, ambiguous uh, set of circumstances. Um, I'm just picturing sort of, you know, Donald Duck barking in German at someone, um, or quacking in German. Um, so anyway, interesting background. He'd also worked in game design. He'd been a gamer. He was very interested in that. Then he moved on, got a proper job, got a life, as we all do. Um, and he was on the faculty at University of South Florida, um, but he also had that, what was interesting, two or three of my cases were, were the faculty person who got pulled into sort of helping with the technology. <laughs> so he had been asked to sort of play with Canvas to 
be the um, early adopter who would then help faculty subsequently learn the tools and get on board. He'd seen this MOOC thing come along, and he was anticipating you know, 50 faculty over the next few years saying, I want to do a MOOC. So he decided to play with Canvas to see if he could support his own MOOC. Um, he chose Fairy Tales, which was an interesting selection, um, and built this all out. So he, he did have some badges. Uh, he realized, so there's an extra challenge with a MOOC that haven't been in the other classes so far, and that's the 1,400 people who signed up for it. So he, you know, and that, that's small for a MOOC. So, you know, he thought ahead about that and thought, I can't be grading thousands or hundreds of papers, that sort of thing. So I'm going to say three aspects of his thing were interesting. He had badges. That was okay. What was interesting was the way he applied that. And he used what he loosely called the Harry Potter Protocol, um, which more correctly, I looked it up, is the dependent hero contingency. Um, so it's not Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. Um, so that means that basically you're dividing a big student group into a, a, big, a big number of students into student groups, which has a double effect. A, you don't have to grade everyone's work, and B, everyone feels a little bit of pressure slash competition not to let the team down. So when Hermione loses points for Gryffindor, she's devastated, you know, it's horrible. Um, and then when she gains them back, it's great because she's given back to the group. So this dependent hero contingency is an interesting element that he threw in. And he's a, he's a great guy, actually. I just bumped into him last week for the first time, having, having worked with him for a couple of years. Um, he, he built in this dependent hero contingency, aware of the fact that he was not going to be able to keep up with the class, and he still couldn't keep up with the class. So his badging kind of fell away. So he had a couple of really good concepts in there that were worth exploring. Um, the third thing that really was his main thing was that he buried Easter eggs through the course. So, looking for facial recognition there. Okay, so anyone who's, who's played games or, uh, I mean, they're in lots of things, videos, DVDs, whatever. Um, sometimes developers will bury little tiny hidden bonuses, like you found an Easter egg. He buried things in the, in the text of his text-heavy pages and throughout the course. Um, I would say he's in the slightly above, well, no, I mean, quite a, a bit above your average faculty member's technical expertise, but not, he's not a programmer, programmer. So he would do things like, in the Canvas system, put in some pages, and maybe on a period or a full stop would put a link. So if you think of the size of that on a small text page, it's pretty hard to see. He would put white text on a white background. I like that one. He would put um, hints in the alt tags of an image. And by going through these, the students could click on something and they would get some sort of reward. I ripped this off. This is what you should do, just rip things off. So in my class that I'm, I'm actually currently still doing it, it's, it's a workshop for OLC around how to gamify or gamefully design a course. Um, I inherited a lot of text and I thought, oh, that's deadly to get through. So I did similarly in their um, system put links, and I, I didn't know what the hell to link to, because it's, you know, it's an artificial construct, and they're playing a game so I can talk about games. So I did some Weebly pages, and basically just put encouragement and then a number. So, hey, the first clue is seven. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, when they clicked through and got all of the clues, and each clue had sort of a hint to the next one. So when they clicked through and got all of the clues, they had a final number, which was the answer. And the answer was 42. Okay, can you explain why 42 is vaguely amusing? Okay, again, certain age, white guy, I tell you, so he's my people. <laughs> um, there was a movie film in, in England, well, no, the book was, hang on, correct me, I, I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about. Douglas Adams, was he English or, or American? He was English, I thought so. Okay, I thought so. Most of the actors had English accents, so I was assuming it. Anyway, a film called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, very whimsical, quirky, strange, weird. And in one of the scenes, they developed the, the smartest, correct me if I'm wrong, the smartest computer in the history of time and everything. And they go up to it and say, right, tell us what's the answer to the universe, what's the answer to everything? Life, the universe, and everything, thank you. Uh, and, and it says, oh, you need to leave me to think about that for 10,000 years. And they come back and they say, okay, now tell us what's the answer. And he goes, 42. <laughs> and, and they're like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Say, well, if you, don't know the, if you don't understand the question, you're not going to understand the answer. Um, so anyway, my clues, which they got, if they got it, added up to 42. And the last page says, okay, the answer, you've got the answer now. You have to tell me why that's the answer and you have to email me it. So the first woman emails me and said, 
oh yeah, the answer's 42, and it's sort of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm like, wow, you were quick. She said, yeah, your Weebly pages, like your first one was called Clue 1 HTML, the second one was called Clue 2 HTML. <laughs> By the time I, I'm like, you fucking idiot. So she completely gamed the system, which is obviously a, a concern. I quickly went in and changed, like from Clue 3, I changed to artichoke.html, then Apple, then Cube, then whatever. And I, I didn't give her the prize. So I, I, had a, I, I got a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy t-shirt. She got a runner-up prize. I thought she was, someone else cheated by looking at the source code and looking for links in the source code. So, you know, um, people cheat. Well, she didn't find the clues. So, you know. And the point was, so, but again, it, it worked because it was an exercise that showed, damn, people cheat. It, it also showed that um, people engage with the content. Now, I have... Three kids, two of them girls. Um, so I do fairy tales, but it's not really my thing. Um, I read these pages a hell of a lot. I could tell you quite a lot about, for example, the Cinderella story, the original origin, where the, uh, the, the ugly sisters or whatever, like, chop their toes off to try and... I mean, there's blood and guts and loose toes. and They're really nasty. The original grim versions of the fairy tales, grim with two Ms, uh, before Walt Disney with one S before he got a hold of them and made them all princesses and Cinderella, you know, flouncy dresses. They were pretty nasty. So I could tell you a lot about the content. Yi was probably the geekiest in terms of looking at his stats and his data, and he would be able to tell you how long people spend on each page, on each page of each content. He said one woman uh, accessed and read the page 27 times. There wasn't an Easter egg on that page. He was, he was tough. Um, I would sort of say after a while, look, there's not an Easter egg here. But... Even just that. So think about, think about what he's doing there. So his badges, eh, the rewards, the incentives, that kind of didn't work. His leaderboard, maybe the competition. Eh. But, you know, the, the, the search. The, here's one. Appropriate level of challenge. If you make those Easter eggs impossible to find, or for some people they feel they're impossible to find, they're done in 10 minutes. I can't do this. And I had that in my class of, you know, educators who were exploring gamification or gameful design. You know, I, I'd get the email, oh, I'm remedial, can you give me more information about this? I'm like, well, you're not, and, you know, you've got to find stuff. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, I had 30 or so in the class altogether. I probably only had about 10 who sent me an answer, and about seven who got it right, and about five who didn't cheat. So maybe not the biggest success in the history of online education, but Yi certainly showed a lot of engagement with the content. MOOCs around that time and even probably currently retention, persistence, completion rate around 4 or 5% typically. Um, he was up like 8 to 10% completion, which again, not changing the world, but 1,400 starting, 140 finishing. His, his completion rate was about double what was typical at the time for, for MOOCs. So something he did kind of worked. Um, as I said, the, the dependent hero contingency I think is interesting. What you do with badges is obviously worth exploring but it was specifically his sort of hidden challenges within the text that made students engage with the text and, you know, hopefully not just look for the eggs, but also read the text. I, I would say that was the case in, in, in my case because he was very clever with the way he hid them and you had to kind of read through carefully. Um, just one more. So this is the last one. Um, so think back to Neil Nyman where he said, make your own story and it can be your grandfather coming from Russia or Matt Damon coming from Hollywood or whatever. Um, Petruzella was more... He was the the biggest gamer of the group. Um, great guy as well, very energetic, fun. Um, he uh, teaches a philosophy class at the Mass College of Liberal Arts, which is uh, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, I think it is. Um, and he created this course that he called Dungeons and Discourse. Again, Dungeons and Dragons, all that sort of stuff. But um, his as well, like Nyman's, was a gen ed philosophy course that a lot of people had to do. His catchment area, his target demo, he has a lot of low SES, first generation um, minority students. Um, fragile learners, if you want to call them that, new majority students, some are calling. Um, his course uh, was a hybrid. It met once every two weeks. And in between, he took them out. I'm pretty sure his was Moodle. And he built out a land through which they had to travel and find scrolls. So he went completely OER. Open Ed Resources, didn't assign a textbook, and put content in places through this 
imaginary land where the students were wandering. So the students picked up these scrolls, got information. So I, I don't remember all of the realms, but you know they were in the realm of logos, where logical thinking was espoused and all that sort of thing. And they would pick up clues and hints and did Parallel to that, he built them all a personalized page in Moodle. So you had your own page, and the students were given license to choose their own image or avatar and personalize the page to an extent. One of the students said, yeah, that was my goal. I wanted to be the most tricked out wizard and so forth or whatever. So they got to personalize their page, and they were given an amount of gold. Again, very low tech, so sort of a GIF image of a gold coin, and you start with 50. You, your gold decayed at the rate of two or three a day because you had to live and you had to eat and that sort of thing. When it got together in the hybrid, face-to-face -face section of the hybrid course, they had what he called the marketplace, where he rewarded students for good questions with gold. Great question, five gold coins. Great question, ten gold coins. And they build it back up. He struggled to keep up with the gold updates, and the students said that. That aside, they thought this was great. Um, he'd had two or three run-throughs. He as well was one of the ones who said that um, his, his declaring of philosophy as a major went from like four students to seven students. So again, those numbers are not significant, significant, but he saw that repeated in the two or three times during the study when he taught the class. Um, the student feedback was, was effusive. They loved this. They thought it was great. By the time he got through the first class and got to the second, um, at the end of uh, major sort of modules or, or maybe it was sort of midterm and at the end, he set up what he called a boss battle. Again, looking for the gamers in the audience. But when you get through a game, often at the end of a stage or something like that, you have like a big fight against a big monster, the boss. And it's tough. By that stage, the hope is that you've invested enough time and energy that you're going to persevere to beat the damn thing. Because if you had the boss battle at the start, you, would just, you wouldn't have the skills, you wouldn't have the expertise, and you wouldn't have the sort of commitment thinking, I'm going to beat this. So he had the boss battle at the end where someone would come and, and argue rhetorically against the class. And you know, that person was arguing fallacies or whatever. So I'm not going to go to politics. But you can imagine you know, someone standing up and making statements. And, oh, this is true, and this is true. And the students had to de debunk his arguments, is what they put. Um, once he got through the class the first time, he started to invite alumni of the previous class to come back and be the boss. And he was astounded at how much they'd retained from the class. So someone who'd taken the class two or three sections ago came back and said, OK, now I'm going to tell you how you're all wrong, and that's wrong, and you don't understand that, and the principle of this is this. And the students had to go, well, no, because according to Socrates, blah, blah, blah. Again, not a philosophy major, so excuse me. But he had them sort of argue back and forth, and they had to try and defeat the boss at the end of this. Um, and he said, oh, it was great. You know, costumes were worn. So you know, people got really into it. The face-to-face -face part was interesting. and. Uh, he said it had a couple of other effects that were really interesting. Um, the students all said that it was really fun to be in a class where more people participated because you were getting gold for your questions. So you know, 20 people would, would shout out rather than two or three. Um, Petrozella noted, he's a very thoughtful guy actually, he noted that um, it democratized the class from a gender, from a minority, from, a, from, a, from his teaching perspective. And I'm, I'm doing it. I don't know why. I've focused on Ian and the guy who knew Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There are people whose eyes I have not made contact, and it's not because I've got a thing about bearded white guys. Um, <laughs> maybe I do. Um, I don't know. You, you gra and, and people talk about your teaching style and how you teach to your own teaching style. So I'm, you know, when I teach, I taught web design, a couple of other courses, project management. You know, I, I would screenshot Dreamweaver, and I'd be like, OK, you click this button, because that's the button I click. And then I started to get students say, hey, I use the drop down. Is that all right? No, don't use the drop down. Yeah. I'd tell them to do what had worked for me. And then you know, having done 500 screenshots and developed web pages and had a student say, I found a YouTube video, I realized I was done in the con. So my first assignment in that class was find something that teaches you this course that you need to know. So you know, they would come up with YouTube videos, audios, whatever, whatever. Um, so point being, there, there's a subconscious, if nothing else, um, tendency, I guess, that we have to focus on certain students. We, we, you, know, you don't intend it. When you make it a game and everyone has to participate, by definition, you are democratizing that participation. And he felt that was a really key element of his course and from the experience, to the extent that he was called before the faculty 
uh, writ large the Senate or the Curriculum Committee or both of them to really talk about what he'd done and how this could work. So, you know, it's interesting. Again, I mentioned they're all different. He prescribed a narrative, you know, maybe at first, this pr again, probably a 50-50 in the room. Dungeon discourse. Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, God. So, you know, you're going to get that. But the fact that he sort of got them to buy into the narrative did have a very positive effect. He had more students focus on philosophy. And his, his takeaway from this, which I think is, is probably the key point that I'd like to, to, to push on, is that students who come in who have the negative mindset, uh, who have the fear of studying if they're first generation, you know, most of us can say, oh yeah, I'm going to that college because my dad went to that college, or I'm going to be a lawyer because my mum's a lawyer. A lot of the generation that we're talking about now that I think, you know, Daniel was sort of looking at, um, they don't have those intrinsic motivators. They don't have those reasons to, to persist. So, you know, anything you can build in. He felt that the students who were philosophy phobic or maybe in Nyman's case were economics phobic, if you can get them playing a game and they think they're maybe failing the game rather than failing the discipline, they'll persist, hopefully to the point where they get enough subject matter expertise that it becomes engaging and intrinsically motivating of its own. So the students who talked about the philosophy class, their language was great because they had kind of the young, hip, cool kid language, but they were using philosophy terms. So, you know, they, they were very sort of intrigued and they got enough into the discipline to say, you know what, philosophy is interesting by itself. So his theory that he was going to push on was, let's try and use this in intro courses in courses with, you know, sort of first-generation students, maybe low SES, fragile learners, because the less... We, we're, we're used to failing at games. We fail at a game. This is a quote, so I'm not just using bad language. You fail at a game, you die, you get shot, you get pissed, you get up and you do it again. You fail at philosophy or maths or economics, and you are crap. That's not a quote. You're, you're crap at economics, you're crap at maths, you're crap at philosophy, you can never do it. I don't know why I started to try this. So the, the failure thing is completely morphed there for whatever reason. But if you can, as he did, sort of get the students failing at a game rather than failing at a discipline, then they might be able to engage enough with the discipline that by the time they realize they're studying a discipline, they actually find it quite interesting. Okay, so the mental notes that you're all taking. So these are some of the commonalities that seem to be really uh, playing a role here. A couple we haven't talked about, or, or not much, the aesthetics, the fear of failure was definitely in there, rewards, level of challenge. These were the bits that I sort of looked across the cases and discussed with the practitioners, and we started to take away that these are the bits that seem to be uh, influential. Um, what, uh, okay, there's, there's, there's one, yeah, okay, these next three are a little uh, more detailed, and then I promise I get to wrap up. So what might be going on here is this is sort of building on the cognitive science bit. It's really hard to learn new stuff. And you have a very limited window where you can do that before you start to get completely fatigued. And it's analogous, this wasn't my idea, someone mentioned this, the, to, to cycling uphill. If you're in a class and you're learning new stuff, it feels like cycling uphill. I'm not going to read the slides. If you're doing something that you're comfortable with, that you've done a thousand times, that you feel really good about, it's like cycling downhill. So how do you make everyone hate, hate learning? Only new knowledge. Uh, information, heavy classes without practice. That's not, and think about that, that's not what happens in games. Um, if you were to pick a game that everyone thinks, so Angry Birds, my first Angry Birds reference. Um, when you start, you have one bird that you catapult across and it, it hits things. When you get through the first like five levels, they give you a different type of bird that does something different. It took me a while to work that out. There's a little one that splits into three. And then once you do another five screens, they give you another bird that blows up when it hits stuff. So in the course of getting through the first 10 screens, you're quite often throwing a bird that you really know what it's going to do. And then once in a while, you'll get a new one that you're not quite sure. So you're doing stuff you're comfortable with, and then you're given something new that you don't really know what's happening. So this is what I think we're trying to do with gamefully designed courses. You're trying to encourage skills that people, you're encouraging strengths that people have you're giving them things that are somewhat familiar, and then you're interspersing that in a game with new knowledge. So all of those examples, that clearly was what was going on, and at least part of it. The, the students who were telling the narrative, I'm very comfortable talking about my grandfather who came from Russia, because we talk about that in family history time, have done for the last 10, 20 years. So, so that's like my comfort food. That's the bit that I'm really happy with, that I'm expert in, that you know, it, it feels really close to me. 
and then I'm tying it into cycling uphill. I'm tying it into scarcity and return on investment and other microeconomic stuff that's kind of new for me, but this is comfortable. So I'll keep talking about my grandfather. And then this happened. And then, so I think you know, that, that's what I take away as, as one of the key elements with this, that you're mixing. What games do is they mix skills that you pick up with new skills, and they encourage you to sort of play with both of them so that you eventually become familiar with them all. At the end of this journey, there's the boss fight where you put it all together. That could be a capstone or a thesis or a final class project. So when I do this presentation, I have to talk to a lot of faculty. Um, and this is, this is genuine. It's not just to placate them. I realize that when you break down those elements and start to think about what good teachers do, they do a lot of this anyway. So this is, a, this is over two slides. So as I say, you'll get these afterwards. But the bits that are in bold are the bits that I'd say I'd certainly make the case good teachers do or completely intend to do, unless they're a bit strange. So you know, providing feedback. Um, I'll stay on that one for now. So rules exist. You know, you've got a deadline for a paper. You, you can't plagiarize. You can't copy, whatever, whatever. Feedback. You know, most instructors, I think, would agree that it's a good idea to let someone know if they're completely messing up or give them positive feedback if they are doing well. Um, I don't see a level of challenge on here, which confuses me, but um, appropriate level of challenge is another one that I'd say is, is certainly a, a, a thing that good teachers do. Most teachers don't like to completely confuse the heck out of everyone in the class, nor should they try and say, okay, today we're going to do basic addition. You know, you don't want to come under, you don't want to come over. So the bold bits in this, a good teacher will reassure a student, try and reduce fear of failure. Go on, Alex, just try it. You can do maths. You can, you're not stupid. Um, and the students have clear expectations. The, the red that are, so these are now the same slides again with the red bits, the things that I think technology and gameful, gameful design can help with. So, you know, if we agree that feedback is a good thing, then, you know, in a face-to-face -face class, you've got a couple of windows for that, maybe a week. In a typical online class, I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to get my PhD tenured research faculty to be 24-7 in online. I just don't do it. And again, to the feedback yesterday, the, the lack of immediacy of feedback is a concern for people who are fragile, who think they are terrible at everything. Um, so I would certainly argue that with rudimentary technology, you could build in means to give immediate continual feedback, even if it's only formative, even if it's only you know, a multiple guess and you're on the right track, keep going, or you haven't quite got this, go and try this extra resource. That's what the adaptive learning tools are doing. And, and, um, we're working with one of the providers right now, and, and I actually see quite a lot of overlap there. So I think you know, a good adaptive learning system that's implemented can do a lot of this as well. Um, but even if you don't have that budget and you're not going that route, then you know, you've got quizzes in Blackboard. You've got rudimentary ways that you can give um, sort of automated feedback. Um, some of the other pieces that technology can help with, what, what, I, what I think is good about the time now is that you know, you can set up a blog in five minutes. You can, you know, do some rudimentary sort of social media type interaction immediately. You can use, use tools that students are already using. So you can certainly develop some of these things, a sense of progression, journey through the materials, um, student having control. Um, some of those other bits, aesthetics, I think, is, is actually underemphasized. That's hugely relevant, just the sort of feeling that someone has when they hit the course. Um, and this notion of effortless involvement. Those two pieces come together for me in, in like the iPod when it first came out. And if you've seen any of the 300 Steve Jobs movies, um, you know, his focus on it has to be beautiful. It has to be simple. Um, and and I, yeah, my, my mum, bless her, is just getting online and getting sorted and that sort of thing. She wants the manual. I'm like, you don't get manuals now. You just kind of play with it and twiddle a button and push something and you learn. Um, so that's the effortless involvement. If your LMS or your system or your class or your online materials take a, a, a PhD to work out, then you're not going to be giving out any PhDs anytime soon. Um, this is just a graphic that pulls those previous things together. So I think you know, there's a big group here. And, and this, again, I think this is key. You are not replacing an instructor with a game. You're looking at what good slash great teachers do already and agree are valuable parts and saying, you know, with gameful design, we can really accentuate some of these. If we all agree this is a good thing, let me help you make more of it. There's a, there's a gray area in there. And this one, I know the text is too small. So uh, Alex will PDF and send around. Um, so yeah, we, we played with this because we were chasing grants and things. So um, 
not, not proud of this slide at all. Student intrinsic motivators for persistence in online learning. Um, I do like the phrase Copernican revolution, and, and this one's had some debate, but again, going back to my Doctor Who days, which is not that long ago, um, you know, it was Saturday night, 6 o'clock. We had to be there because the TV told us we had to be there, and we all watched it, and then we talked about it at school on Monday. So it was almost like we were sort of circling around the TV. If you look at Netflix now, um, I think it was my buddy Robert I was talking to the other day, and he was saying, you know, how he, he only binge watches stuff now. Because we don't want to watch one TV show, then get in a different mindset and watch a different one. We want to do 10 shows. Um, I took a big international flight and watched the, the whole final series of Mad Men, one after the other. It, it revolves around me now. If I want to watch a certain show at a certain time or five certain shows, it's, it's me. And I think that's the, I like that phrase, the Copernican Revolution. It's, it's saying the student, to an extent, wants to feel that they're in control and that they're at the center of this. So the, the more sort of tailored an experience you can give them where they have control, they may be making the narrative or they may be taking on a role and personalizing and, and making an avatar, but they feel that sense of control. And I think that um, is an important part of where we're at with the technology. We can start to do that now as well. Um, I mentioned the project we're on now. We, we did get first in the world, FITW, uh, funding. And our target is to complete STEM degree completion for transfer students only within a dedicated uh, sub-brand uh, of Northeastern University called the Lowell Institute. The Lowell Institute's been going for about 150 years. It was whatever the equivalent of PowerPoint was 150 years ago. Northeastern was trying to sort of educate the masses of Boston um, with basic science and technology training. The descendant of that original founder is, is on the Northeastern board now. So with him and with the First in the World funding, we're trying to ramp up this institution that will um, complete underrepresented minority, increase underrepresented minority completion of STEM degrees. Um, and it tied nicely with the stuff I'd been doing um, in my research throwing across the gameful design and saying this is definitely worth exploring. So we have a BS in IT degree that we're playing with in a traditional, traditional online and then a gameful design online. And we're hoping to get the numbers and the effect to see that there's a, hopefully a significant um, uptick in, first of all, engagement, which we think will lead to persistence. Um, so that's where we're going with that. I'm happy to, to bore people with that more later. And we boiled this down. So all of those elements that I talked about, the intrinsic motivators that when combined may engender flow, uh, we put into a matrix. Um, again, text too small for you to read. But you know, I would make the case and say you know, a good syllabus and a decent LMS. Um, rules, yeah, sure. Effortless involvement, yeah, pretty much. Uh, sense of progression could be, sort of, yeah. And then our theory is that we can push those things further out by uh, implementing gameful design principles. So you're going from that, which, you know, let's say that retains at X, this hopefully retains at X plus something that's sort of significant. Um, so I think just to sort of wrap up, it, it, it is a challenge, and, and it's this question of, you know, are we gamifying? Are we producing educational games? Is it serious gaming? Is it gameful design? I think this is the really hard thing to do. I think to try and think that you're going to rival the World of Warcraft or the pick your game. Uh, the budget for that was something like 75 million all told. So if you've got that funding, super, congratulations. Where I've seen games implemented, some, you know, some have been pretty decent. Before I got to Northeastern, they worked with one of those vendors who developed the courses, put them online, and then take 80% of the revenue. Good business model. Um, and they, to, to give them credit, they build out courses pretty well. Some of them had simulations. The School of Business loves to show you the Somalian pirate kidnapping negotiation scenario. Um, but they can't, they can't tweak it. They built a simulation, and it's pretty good. And the first time you see it, you're like, yeah, OK. The tenth time, you want to just poke your eyes out with a fork. Um, but you know, it's engaging. But they can't edit it. They can't change it. It's now very dated. It's, you know, are there still Somalian pirates out there? You know, you're going to be locked into some cultural references that are, that are dubious. If you are gamefully designing a course and just accentuating certain elements and seeing the effect, you can go back and, and do more of that or, you know, move to the next one and say, right, let's really work on the aesthetics. My understanding, having looked and worked with those cases, is pick them. If you've got 10 criteria that you think, yeah, it looks like these will have an effect, then find a faculty member who, who is interested in this and say, okay, let's, let's look at immediate corrective feedback. How can we ramp that up in your course? And even if you only do one thing, so 
you know, I hope people aren't disappointed, but I try and get people away. I personally try and get people away from the let's build a game that teaches everything and does everything. Because this is what you're competing with. You're competing with games and, and budgets and, and hooks and psychologies that you know, are, are so expert that you're going to struggle to either educate or have fun or probably more likely struggle with both. Um, so I've, I've thrown in uh, sort of the references that uh, I've used in this, and my contact details are in there. Um, we're not bad on time. I haven't left a great deal of time. I'm certainly around, but um, I'd love any questions, thoughts, or reactions. Um, and, and as I say, the feedback I got from got, the, the students sure said, yeah, it would have been great if it was automated, if it was more 3D-ish and that sort of thing. But to a person, they said, it was great, it was fun. We really appreciate Gerald or Neil trying this. And, you know, I actually got quite a kick out of it. I was really surprised. So sketch stuff out. Use cheapy versions to see if they work. You don't have to go fully in and, and commit tens of thousands of dollars. I think there are certainly things in there that you could work on tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm just going to work on the aesthetics. I'm going to get nicer graphics for my course. It, it, it probably won't, you know, make you the savior of higher ed, but it may just retain that one student who is just feeling like they're done and, and don't have the confidence to keep going. So um, thank you Who for your time. Who has the first question? Throw me questions. Thanks. <laughs> yes. So my question is, um, I think gamification has a marketing problem. When you're talking to uh, mm -hmm. faculty in higher ed, you say, hey, why don't you gamify your course or make it more like a game, and it's like crickets. Yeah. But if someone's like, I want, everyone wants more student engagement, and if you, if you give them an example that's gamified, but you don't use that word game, yeah. they buy in. Like, do you see this as a problem with you know, faculty? I do. It's, a, it's like I say, it's definitely you know, the half the room wants to run Scream, and the other half are interested. I, I've started to talk a lot. I mean, we talk about gameful design. It's still the G word. So I think people get that intrinsically motivating students. That, that one slide with the lollipop versus the wee, we can all kind of see that. That's a, it's a really simple metaphor. A pat on the head and a sort of you know, encouragement 48 hours after you made a discussion board post. I don't really feel it, but if just by doing it, you can make mowing the lawn interesting. So I think to push the development of this, I would certainly, with faculty, talk about intrinsic motivators and engagement. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't and don't touch the gamification word too much except the Penn faculty made me do it. Um, and actually, this uh, shameless self-promotion, if I ever get it done, um, I did a poster session on my dissertation and, and um, got asked if I would uh, produce a book that they want to title Gamification. <laughs> I'm like, uh, can we change it? So I, I don't know. I, I, I've had online 3.0 as a title, and I think that sucks as well. But I think you know, student engagement, intrinsic motivators, and then and this is, this is genuine. I mean, I, I'm really, I hope you get a chance to see Paul LeBlanc speak. Michelle's great. Paul LeBlanc is a very genuine guy. He's a very smart guy. He's a very focused guy. And he's great, great fun. He, his greatest strength is he is genuinely interested in making people's lives less crap. And he's had so much, you know, he's had a great deal of publicity at SNU. And, you know, College for America maybe hasn't broken uh, even on revenue, but it's got them millions of dollars of publicity. So, you know, he's done very, very well. But even when I started at SNU and they were pretty fledgling in the online, his goal was to get students who were, you know, literally the sort of Walmart shop floor and try and get them up to middle management. And he's had that laser sort of focus. And I think if you tie this, whatever we call it, to the demographic changes that we're all seeing and saying, hey, you might feel comfortable right now at your Northeastern or at your SUNY with the student demographic you've got, but think 10 years from now when you're going to have so many first generation students, minority students, and significantly low SES students, then if you tie, and I, I, I reference Paul because I think there's a genuineness to this. You have to look at the change in demographic of students. You have to consider engagement and intrinsic motivation. So if you can tie that together, and get an educated room of faculty to say, look, we have to agree on this, then you maybe don't have to go the other way. I think that, that is what Paul's done. He's, he's really said, look, I'm genuine about this. We need to try different things. And you know, he, he's, he's the one with a reduced fear of failure. He, he went for that. He went to the board and asked for substantial amounts of money for things that may not have worked and may not, still not work. But he tried. And I think that's all we can do. We can say, look, there's a clear challenge. There are clearly ways that look interesting that could help. 
now work with me on this. So, so you're right. I mean, the, the gamification thing is a double-edged sword, and I'd be wary about using it, to be honest. But intrinsic motivation, engagement, change in demographics, I think those bits you can't deny. Sorry, that was a long answer. Any other questions? Nate? I haven't used these mics before. Did that work? Yeah. It's wonderful. Awesome. So uh, in your comment about uh, how you wanted to poke your eyes out with a fork after you watched the canned simulation for the 7,000th time, um, have you experimented with open educational resources as a solution to being able to more highly uh, tweak, mm -hmm. to use your word, the uh, learning materials? Yeah, the one, the one that I'm talking about there, because it was vendor produced in their platform, we couldn't. I mean, I, I don't even know what it was built on. Um, Absolutely, in terms of the OER. We also, um, at Northeastern, uh, before the grant work, we're doing quite a lot with Storyline, which eh, it, it allows quite a bit of animation. And in terms of tech level, it's, it's a step up from your PowerPoint. But you know, a well-intentioned LMS educated, I, I don't know, your, your basic level of tech support could probably help with that quite quickly. So we've built in, not as complex as the Somalian pirates, but we've built in small sort of simulations, animations, drag and drop, immediate feedback, and that is, is something that you can edit. So yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this before, steal, borrow, whatever. I mean, with, with open ed resources, certainly you can switch them in and out. Um, if you are doing your own build, then, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I would start with what you've got. Wear a Blackboard school, start with your LMS, and start throwing up, you know, Google Docs or whatever you're using that you can deal with. And then when you start to get traction, maybe explore a storyline or I forget the other, there's another one that's sort of similar. Um, and then, you know, if you want to push it from there, then there are a lot of really interesting companies out there. We're working with Cogbooks, an adaptive learning provider. Um, Smart Sparrow are fun. They do a lot of simulations and animations as well. Um, realize it. There's a, there's a bunch. So, you know, you get the $20 buy-in, which is you, sorry. Um, and then you get the sort of... Um, maybe the middle one that, that Greg, the University of Waterloo, get your IT guys to help you. And then if and when you can prove some proof of concept, then I would suggest going up to maybe self-editable. And then if you want to go for it and, and build the, the complex one, do it. Um, but I, I guess my main point is there's, there's buy-in at, at low levels. So I don't feel you're wise to jump in and go full-on simulation. Fine, if, if it's OER and you can find them, um, great. I would link to those. So, so in the in the examples you gave, you know, a lot of them weren't so much the the leaderboard style of of uh, the gamification aspect, um, and we we know that not all students are intrinsically motivated by competition. So, did you see in the the cases where the course did have that leaderboard aspect that there were students who didn't engage that there were that there was either a certain population that 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 wasn't really engaged with that or is did that was it a self selection process that they knew they were getting into that in the first place and so we don't know if students who, who yeah no, who that wouldn't work for just don't opt in it, it, it's a good question it's why we sort of bundled in the matrix the C's this competition collaboration cooperation or something like that so so I think you're wise to think about the human interactions that, that go on there. I've not seen and, and don't, I, I personally agree with you, I don't recommend the participate in this and you might win um, style of leaderboard. I think there's an interest to sort of the middle ground of, you know, oh, I'm doing okay, but I think you can give that feedback in ways that are probably better than a leaderboard. So uh, all of my cases, I think there were two who sort of used leaderboards, Kevin sort of fell away. Neil totally didn't want them, and Gerald had them, and his, he was the one that said, yeah, the boys rushed ahead and said, oh, I'm top of the leaderboard for two weeks, and then disengaged. So I think, again, if you can present it as intrinsically part of the experience, fine. Um, and that might be where Kevin was, was going with the dependent hero contingency. Um, it, I, my, my, sorry, one, one final anecdote, I promise. Um, my dad was a, was a teacher in a really rough area outside Newcastle, which is northern England. Um, and he came across and saw my graduation at Penn, and it was great. He's, he's, he's a ginger, so he got completely sunburned, didn't wear a hat. Um, 
and he kept telling me how, you know, because I use sort of big words and, and was finishing the doctorate, he didn't understand any of my stuff. And then I was talking to him at one point and sort of explaining a bit more. And he shared that in like 1970 something, so Newcastle's famous for three things. Anyone? Coal? Coal and? Beer and? Thank you. Football as well. Correct answer. Um, so coal, beer, and football. Uh, coal and beer weren't really going to work with his under 11s. Um, so <laughs> what he did was uh, he identified their floor. None of them could spell anything. Um, so he did league tables for spelling. And in the British soccer, sort of, unlike your American football, if you finish bottom of the league, you can get booted down to the league below. It's called relegation. And then if you do well, you get promoted. So he had like two divisions. And students were at risk of relegation or getting promotion. And, and he had students who would be so excited about doing spellings. And kids who were terrible, who would work really, really, really hard. And his deputy head, which is like a vice principal, at some point said, you have to stop because of the two at the bottom of the league. You know, it's, it's disappointing for them. It's upsetting for them. So I get it. I think, you know, on the other hand, in the 70s, my dad was doing stuff that I'm like, this guy was a genius. He just never told me. You know, he was doing stuff that motivated a lot of students so I guess my point is if you can accentuate anything that's motivating and somehow avoid that piece, so I don't know. I, I, that's what I worry about leaderboard. It's hard. Even if you anonymize, you still have that sense that someone is bottom of the league. Um, so yeah, I think there are probably better ways to give feedback and acknowledgement and reward than saying you're top of the league. But again, none of the students complained in these examples. They appreciated the effort. Um, but yeah, it might be that one where your administrators will be sensitive to that as well. Yes, sir, in the back. Making our course content accessible to all learners is very important. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of Gameful Design and how we can make Gameful Design accessible for all users and inclusive. That's, uh, were you lurking in my class? I got the very same question from my online section that's going on um, last night. And I haven't answered it there either. So thank you for making me think about it. <laughs> Um, I think because you're shifting from simulations and World of Warcraft to basically good instruction with you know, immediate feedback that is probably text-based, I, I don't see that a lot of the gameful design elements, I'm now trying to think, um, I don't see that a lot of the gameful design elements um, have an issue with that. I mean, aesthetics, arguably. Uh, you know, I mean, if we're still in the world of which we should be, you know, alt tagging images, um, transcribing videos. I mean, those are things that obviously you know, if you've got a student who's visually impaired, the efforts you make on aesthetics are going to be less effective there. Um, and that's a shame. Um, but I don't see anything, even in the cases that I worked with, where I thought, ooh, that's a red flag. So I think, you know, so long as you're diligent and do the transcriptions and do the tags and, do, and make it sort of screen reader accessible, none of them did anything with technology that took them into the realms of this is a problem as far as I saw it. Now, if we're going to simulations and you know, interactivity at a very high degree, that would certainly be a concern. So, and again, that could be a, a strength when you pitch to faculty or administrators because we are conscious of that, we are not going to World of Warcraft, so you don't need to give me $50 million, which will probably be a win-win, I would think. They'll probably be happy with that. So, sneak one more. Okay, Sorry. one more. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about differences and how maybe women and girls take on the ideas of gamification and games compared to... Um... Mm. I think it's, it's maybe connected to the, the... So the cliche is that the boys compete and the girls want to collaborate. Um, in my online class, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've asked people to dig into something that engenders flow. So some of them did games, some of them did other things. A lot of the responses I got from some of the women were that they don't like competition but they really pushed themselves against the game. So I think if you, I, 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 I honestly don't have a sort of pat answer to that. What, what I've seen from the data is that there are as many girls gaming as boys. So you know, my earlier slide where I said maybe it's not about millennials gaming, but if it is, then that gender balance seems to be there. Um, what I've seen, speaking as a, as a male, what I've seen in the gender splits when I've done work on this is that the, the males are comfortable with the chest beating, look at me, I'm top of the board, whereas the women kind of subtly compete. And actually, although they will often say, I don't like to compete, um, they really like to push themselves and challenge themselves. So I think competition is maybe more ostentatious on the male side, and it's subtle and it's there on the female side. And again, these are things I think that you've got to just sort of try and be open to the feedback. So again, as with the leaderboards, 
I think competition is, is definitely one to be cautious of, but then how does that speak to appropriate level of challenge? Because you want to push people. Whitewater rafting is the example. You know, it's tough, it's difficult, but you finish it and you have such a sense of achievement. That one of the golfer where she got a hole in one or whatever. Um, you know, you want, the comp you want the challenge to be such that you feel like you're competing with something. It might be with the system. I think the leaderboard, ostentatious, is a bit of a, a man, a, a guy thing. So I think, I think you're, you're right to be wary of it. Um, but I, I think, I think it, would, it would be a disservice to say we're not going to make it challenging for Alex, because I know Alex, and I know she's going to grit her teeth and, and challenge herself, if not compete with others. Um, sorry. All right. Hi. Janet. Yes, I just have one, one last question, sir. Sure. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Do you have an example of a, of a course which uses well-designed games, which you could make available to us so that we could see a model? No. Um. <laughs> so, you know, Janet, I want to, I don't know if you were here last year. I don't know you, if you were here last year, but um, Landon Phillips presented last year and actually showed his Photoshop course that is uh, an extraordinary example of, um, uh, of, uh, Gameful design. That's I on the code site. And it's on the code site. It's a presentation that you can go look at. Thank you. Um, well, and, and also for this class I'm teaching right now, I don't think they would have a problem. I'm pulling together resources. There are a lot of open ed games and resources that are good that show some of this. It is difficult to get you access into a blackboard protected class that's got subtle gameful elements in. Um, my, uh, I have a fuller presentation that has more, more screen. My dissertation has more screenshots and stuff from the examples that I've given there. And I mentioned I'm working on a book that I'm never going to finish, so don't worry about that. Um, I'd be okay. I'll share my resource list from the class, and I don't advise you read it all, but skim through my dissertation, which I'm happy to throw across as well. Um, and then if you see me on the book tour in 2025. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time. I'll be around and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks uh, very much, Kevin. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then uh, Christy Ford is going to um, uh, follow up. And so about 15 minutes. <laughs>